one last point, it doesn't really end in December 11. I mean, that's where we find the recommendations for development of PF. At that particular point, it, we've got to implement them, and then through that implementation is to, to you know, is to, to gain ownership of all those particular ideas. Okay, this next slide is my last slide. And I, and I hope that as you're walking around the floor downstairs, you get a chance to stop at the Center for the Professional Ethics uh, booth that's down there with Colonel Hamm and, and his team. And in there they have videos, the phenomenal videos, videos that were prepared for um, our basic training in AIT soldiers, videos that were prepared for our pre-commissioning cadets and, and OCS candidates, um, videos that, matter of fact, my son's a lieutenant in Baghdad. I sent a couple videos to him. He sits down with his platoon out there, and, you know, they go through them. These are real-world uh, situational-based dilemmas that junior leaders have to face with, but they're tremendous. Plus, you have all the other products, some of those products that you see up there on the slide. This pamphlet in particular, I want to highlight this one. I, if, uh, I would really, you know, this right here is really talks about what the professional bond really is. This is the white paper encapsulated on a, a great document, and it's uh, written to the level that not only uh, someone like you and I can, can read and understand, but also our youngest sergeants and our youngest soldiers and even lieutenants can understand it as well. So if anything, please uh, stop by and, and pick that one up. Uh, and, but, all, but it's down there where you can see a lot of that. And we also have a lot of those products on the table to your left there. So as you leave at the end of the day, please feel free to, as you uh, file out, to pick something up. We're excited about the opportunity to do this, to study our profession, to talk about our profession. We invite all of you to be partners with us in it. Uh, particularly as we go out for the next year. So if you find yourself on one of these forums or one of these OPDs or NCOPDs, uh, that we can have this discussion. And your ideas, your thoughts about all of, the, all of this are critically important as we progress over the next year. So thank you very much. With that, I'll pass it off to uh, Colonel Hanna, and he is our panel moderator. He's going to go ahead and uh, introduce our panelists, and uh, he's got a couple comments himself. So thank you, Mr. Sure, thank you very much for that, that overview. My role this morning is uh, very small, but it's a place of honor because I get to introduce uh, the, the great soldier standing off to my left that we'll be talking to today in the panel. I'll be prepared to answer questions afterwards if anybody has questions of, uh, in the case. First to my left is Command Sergeant Major Frank Griffey, a brave soldier who's been a senior non-commissioned officer at every level from squad all the way up to the I Corps, a Sergeant Major. He served in combat in both OIF and OEF as the CSM of MNFI, or excuse me, MNCI, as a Command Sergeant Major of the 101st Airborne, Command Sergeant Major of the 1st BCT of 10th Mountain Division, Command Sergeant Major of 187 Infantry, 10th Mountain Division, served in Ranger units, and a great soldier. Next to the left is Dr. Don Snyder, who's a senior fellow in the Center for the Army Profession and Ethic, working very closely with us every day. He's also an adjunct research professor at the U.S. Army War College and a professor of political science emeritus from, from West Point where he served for many years. Uh, Don, for many of you know, has been advancing the profession for many years to include two outstanding volumes on the Army as a profession of arms. Um, the Future of the Army Profession is the, the title of those. But he's also a soldier with three combat tours in Vietnam and is a, a former battalion commander. Next to the left, a little introduction is needed for General Retired Frederick Franks. He is currently serving, continuing to serve uh, his army as a steward of the profession. He's the class of 1966 chair in the Simon Center for the Professional Military Ethic at West Point. He's also a mentor to CAPE. We rely on him heavily. He's a senior advisor of the Wounded Warrior Program for the Army and many other posts where he advises and mentors and continues to steward. Of course, he was the commanding general of TRADOC and also the commanding general of the 7th Corps, the main attack force in Desert Storm of course served earlier in his career in Vietnam and many other command and staff critical positions. Next to the left is Major General Robert Brown. And sir, congratulations on your incoming position here as the Commanding General of Fort Benning and the Maneuver COE is quite an honorable position. He's moving from being the Chief of Staff of USER and 7th Army, previously served in General Caslin as Assistant Division Commander in OIF, previous Commander of first SBCT of 25th and also commander of, of 25 Cav. And last, finally, is Colonel Walt Pyatt. He's currently a senior fellow, Army fellow at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy off at Georgetown University, the School of Foreign Service. 
Previously, he was the commander of 3 BCT, 25th ID, and also served as a G3 of 25th ID and MND NOR in OIF. Prior to that, he served also in OEF as the commander of 227 Wolfhounds and as the uh, deputy chief of staff for CJTF Mountain OEF. So as you can see, we have, uh, as General Kazan has already remarked, a great wealth of experience spanning many decades up here, and uh, we're very thankful to have them to talk about what it means to be a profession and what it means to be a professional soldier. So without any further comments, I'd like to turn it over to Command Sergeant Major Griffey. Good morning to you all. It's great to be here this morning, and I can honestly say I'm humbled and quite excited to be amongst you all today to talk about our, our great profession, our United States Army, and our Department of Defense as a whole as we uh, engage in this uh, campaign. I have some written comments here so I can fit within my, my 10 to 12 minute window of explaining some of my thoughts to you as a, as a senior non-commissioned officer in today's military. And again, these comments I'm gonna bring up you know, apply at all levels. And, and, and most of all, you know, everything we talk about, the one takeaway has to be, it needs to be able to easily transition and translate to our sergeants and our young junior officers who on a daily basis, you know, take care of the majority of our force on the ground. My comments are tailored to the fact that I personally feel it, it's great to look back over the last nine years of combat and bring up some of our successes as a profession and the professionalism of our soldiers to get us to where we are at today in our campaign as an army, the most superior ground force in the world, okay? And to bring up and highlight some of the goodness of what we've done as a profession. And then I'm gonna transition into the facts of what I'm seeing on the ground as a combat leader with some of uh, the goodness and some of the degradation in some of our garrison activities, and just some of the discipline issues that you know have an effect on the profession and have an effect on our professionalism and uh, how we're gonna overcome this. So with that said, I'm gonna rapid fire some comments at you. And, uh, and again, it's an honor as a as a sergeant major to be representing the finest NCO Corps in the world, and obviously to take point here in this panel, and as a first corps sergeant major, just that, be first with some comments. So with that said, let's lock and load, and I'm gonna bring you through, through some of my thoughts and what I've seen over the last nine years and what I see for our future environment. You know, as we enter our 10th year of persistent conflict, without a doubt, we are the finest army our nation has ever produced. You know, and obviously the force is under some stress and a bit out of balance, but uh, as a combat leader, I'm quite optimistic about our future successes. And uh, you know, one of our successes that lends directly to our professionalism is our initial entry standards for the Department of Defense, which for the most part only allows, you know, a small number of our population into our profession. Okay, and our trade act takes those individuals, the most important resource in America, our sons and daughters, and our trade act takes these great citizens and through high standards of doctrinal training, adherence to Army values, and with great small unit leadership, you know, reproduce the finest warriors in the world. And obviously this tra tradition must continue. Uh, tactical level comment here. Um, one of the things we've really become good at as a ground force is to look holistically at ensuring that all soldiers within our force are trained continually on warrior tasks and skills. Combat focused physical training to include combatives on a weekly basis. We continually adhere to that. The simplicity of understanding across all levels, advanced marksmanship training, advanced medical skills training, okay, coupled with basic knowledge of tactics, you know, continually enable our individual soldiers to meet the needs of all the conditions and under the environments that they're gonna continue on. Now, I'd like to, to talk about, over the last nine years, some of the, the, the large army uh, strategic level aspects that as a profession, we've, uh, we've transitioned into to adapt to our, our uh, combat and uh, having the agility to uh, continually focus on the fight 
Let's talk about our modernization and modularization within the force that's paid great dividends, you know, and, and our continual modularization, the continual refinement of our ENCO must be a priority, okay, within our profession as we mature these elements. You know, the tactical level issue of COIST teams as an example is a prime example of, of our profession adapting our MTO to the fight, all right? The refinement of striker brigade combat teams, aviation brigades, sustainment brigades, our battlefield sustainment brigade, the BFSB, are examples of needed formations that have developed directly to meet the needs of our expeditionary army. How about our citizen soldiers out there, our National Guard and our Reserve? How many Guard and Reserves do I have in here this morning? Come on, raise your hand, all right? You know, our Guard and Reserve, what a professional force we have become. And on bottom line up front, you know, our Guard and Reserve are the combat multiplier for our nation. And we cannot fight this persistent conflict as successfully as we have without their continual presence and proper resourcing at the federal state levels will, and continued mentorship by First Army will ensure theirs and our success. One of the things I've personally seen since our first deployments into uh, Uzbekistan and Afghanistan nine years ago is a continued maturation of the proper integration and synchronization of the joint conventional soft, interagency, intergovernmental, and our ability to positively work amongst each other. That's one of the hallmarks of our profession at this time. It just goes to show the professionalism of our officers and NCOs and our, you know, our, our, our government workers as we come together to ensure that all factors of our national power are brought to bear. We're mastering the ability to work as a combined force with modern foreign militaries as well as indigenous forces throughout the various theaters. And obviously, this is all hard work between our interagencies, joint services, combined forces, indigenous forces, you name it. Our young soldiers are out there making it happen. The working relationship that is maturing within these various elements is obviously providing the synergy needed you know, across the whole spectrum of coin, stability, theater cooperation, and obviously, when the time comes, full spectrum operations. You know, on the logistics side of the house, just think about how AMC has matured over the years and has continually developed and refined this intricate network of research, development, combining the finest of Army and civilian collaboration. New combat systems have been developed across the spectrum, tested and approved in a timely, and I say again, a timely manner, and then sent out through a logistical system that is a marvel of all militaries. And obviously, you know, as a profession, we must keep this relationship with American industry, American academia, and our army healthy at all costs. You know, an example at the moment, RDECOM, you know, is, is, has this concept of bringing just returned combat veterans directly to the labs to give feedback on products, systems, and that's a great example of the soldier to scientist interaction, another aspect of our profession. Our Arfurgen cycle, you know, for all of us who have been continually deployed for the last nine years, you know, we know the benefits of the Arfurgen. You know, another process that brings great dividends to our Army, and it affects us at the strategic, operational, and tactical level. And this concept allows a senior mission command on an installation to bring into play the powers of AMC, HRC, MCOM, and MEDCOM directly into the heart and soul of a returned unit at every level, from the individual dog handler to the brigade combat team. You know, timelines are adhered to ensure turning soldiers are reintegrated with loved ones, medical needs addressed, equipment reset, and a systematic concept of remanning is accomplished. And this building block approach, obviously, is the next step to the deployment date or date to be ready for global expeditionary use. And it allows our soldiers that sense of stability for our soldiers and our families. Now, you know, as I bring up these positive aspects of what we've done as a profession, you know, take into consideration that why we've matured our Army and we have fought this fight 
It's just that. We have been in contact with our enemies continually the whole time as we've matured these systems. Our professional military education is continually evolving in support of the fight and our soldiers' personal development. We have the finest officers, the finest NCO Corps that in the world do greatly in part to our OES and NCOES systems. The continuing refinement of outcome-based training methodology to, to the curriculums that reinforce values, moral judgment in combat, cultural awareness, resiliency, and obviously the, the concepts of comprehensive soldier fitness all play a part in today's Army fabric. Our soldiers are smart and quite adaptive, and we owe them the schooling that challenges and refines them for all levels of combat. As a profession, we, all you here, allow our nation to successfully project our national foreign policy at the strategic level. We are the profession that recruits, trains, equips, and leads in combat less than 1% of our nation's total population of 330 million. Well, think about that. Think about that as a profession and the professionalism it takes to ensure this happens on a daily basis. You know, we are the profession that is conducting major ground operations in two specific countries to include the Philippines, Trans-Sahara, Horn of Africa, and 80 other countries that we conduct theater cooperation with. We do this every day to the highest levels of professionalism. You know, while we campaign, our families are there for us, another aspect of our profession. You know, we've recognized the fact that 60% of our force is married. We've also recognized that we must care for our families as much as we care for our fellow soldiers. We must never break our family covenant, another aspect of the maturation of our Army. We must continue to refine and address all areas of care for our families. All levels of leadership within our nation and our military must continually and overtly show this care to our families. Along with our families, we must continue to reach out to our nation and to our communities. We must be one with our communities that reside in and around our installations and obviously beyond. We must tell our story. We have to leverage our causes as well as our community and our political leaders at all levels to ensure that our profession is not out of touch with our nation. The Army Community Covenant, just like our family covenant, is another aspect that we cannot just become just a term as we continue our nation's fight. And I'm gonna address some of the, the present issues that I'm seeing as a combat leader. And uh, again, as I address these, <clears throat> remember, I, I just have some written comments here. I wanna rapid fire out to you, but I'm really looking forward to dialoguing with you as a, as a group. And once this is, you know, I put these comments out to you. Okay, we are the most powerful ground force in the world, without a doubt. And uh, we are the most razor sharp army our army's ever produced. And uh, the challenge of our profession is to keep it that way, to make sure we do not dull. You know, at the moment with our army, there are challenges that we leaders need to immediately address, or we're gonna start losing some of that sharpness. Okay, they're out of tolerance standards that consist of higher than normal suicide rate, higher than usual sexual and domestic assault, drug use, alcohol abuse. All of these issues can be traced directly back to our high up tempo over the last nine years. We have to overcome these issues with proper leadership, resource of education, medical plus legal resources, and bottom line up front, this is our profession as we've heard General Castlin talk about. It's the old-fashioned patient leadership taking the human dimension into mind. Tough love. Another uh, critical area that will break us if we are not careful is the degradation of our so-called garrison skills. Now, as a combat leader, I'd much rather call these uh, readiness systems. But we have to emplace, reinforce, and re-educate systems and structures that allow our Army to properly operate, again, properly operate outside of the war zone. System and structures that allow our Army to properly reset and train for the next deployment. 
from basic standards of discipline, Army traditions, and soldier readiness management to training and resource management, proper standards and maintenance, and accountability. So many systems are degrading at the moment. The simplicity of running a company training meeting, preparing for and running a live fire range, ensuring that NCOERs are timely, monthly counseling is uh, accomplished, platoon PT schedules are posted and fit to the fit standards of discipline. You know, we've become razor edge and razor sharp in combat, but you know, I can honestly say, you know, at times, you know, we, we've left our honing sharpening stone back there in theater. So we have to find a way to place these systems back into place. And uh, we could successfully train for the next fight. And while we do this, we have to keep in mind the fact that we have a combat season force throughout the entirety of our Army. And uh, the bottom line up front is, you know, we cannot afford to go back to the 90s Army where we're drawing out QTVs and, and safety standards that dampened challenging, realistic, rugged training. You know, we, we can't go back there. We have to have a fine balance right now. But our profession, you, the professionals out there, we seasoned leaders, okay, we do need to coach. We need to mentor and effectively communicate to the lower levels and explain why. We gotta be able to explain why, as I stated earlier. You know, has to be translated down to that sergeant and that staff sergeant that platoon leader and that platoon sergeant. And we have to be able to educate those individuals and ensure that those company commanders and first sergeants who on a daily basis at this very moment are taking care of 90% of our military understand our intent here at the higher levels. All right. <clears throat> Couple thoughts here. Senior mission commanders, all right, on both TRADOC Forces Command, Overseas Installations, we need to ensure the highest levels that we overwatch and look at our 350-1s, our policy letters, our SRP sites, our garrison support activities, our non-commissioned officer academies on site, DPTMS, just to name a few. It's on us to ensure that those systems are in place. And uh, we need to reestablish systems that, that must continually reinforce and teach Army values, care for our soldiers and families, and we need to be able to attain high obtainable standards and continually develop our leaders, the professionalism of our individual leaders, the professionalism of our junior enlisted, and our profession as a whole. Now, I personally am quite optimistic they will be successful to overcome these challenges I just identified with. And uh, you know, as you've heard continually, this is not gonna happen overnight, but constant positive attention by those of us who know will allow our junior leaders to effectively learn. And obviously our profession will not fail this mission. In closing, you know, I would just like to thank everyone here today for, for coming in here and hearing what this panel has to, has to say. I look forward to discussing issues with you. And uh, as a, a command sergeant major, I look forward to learning from uh, this panel discussion today myself. So again, what I'd like for you to take away from this is that we have challenges within our Army, okay? But those challenges will be addressed as a profession and we'll continually fix, adapt, okay? Fight our nation's fights and keep the force healthy to include our families, to include our Department of Defense workers, and to include all those throughout the rest of the government and industry that support us on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you, Command Sergeant Major Crippy, for kicking us off so well, and I'd like to now turn over to Dr. Don Snyder. Can you uh, test? Am I on? Can you hear me in the back? Okay. If you want to be put in a herd on a panel, just follow a extremely articulate, knowledgeable senior leader, the non-commissioned level who just presented an excellent fine-grained fine analysis of uh, what's going on in the profession. Sergeant Major, thank you. Very insightful. My, uh, my task is slightly different. 
task is to build a framework for you within which to think. How do we think in this campaign about professions? You've been given two definitions, but they're rather constrained. So let me back up to kind of 300, 3,000 feet and say, what's the framework within which we're, this campaign and this dialogue is, is to proceed? Let's start with a macro definition of a profession. What is a profession? A profession is the way that organize, that societies organize expert work. Not all work that's done in the societies is expert. A lot of work done in society is non-expert. It's done commercially, it's done under business, it's done under the profit motive. A lot of work, productive work in societies is done by government occupations, increasingly so in America, in the service economy. Those government occupations are the great debate in the political election this year about how much they're all costing us. But for this discussion, those are not, that is not expert work. Think of the Internal Revenue Service, think of the Department of Transportation. These are government occupations housed in hierarchical bureaucracies, federal, state, and local. A profession is quite different. A profession is society's way of organizing expert work, the kind of work that it takes years to learn, built on fields of abstract knowledge that the professional has to put in their mind and then practice without reference in most cases to what they've studied. How many soldiers do you see walking on patrol with a manual? How many doctors do you see doing surgery with notes from when they were in medical school? Professionals act and practice their knowledge, which is expert knowledge. Now, what is the expert knowledge of the military profession? Let me give it to you in very stark language. It was alluded to in the film that General Caslin showed earlier, but the work of the military profession and that which separates it from every other profession in America are the four tasks of a soldier, to prepare to kill and under right authority to kill. And since there is dying on the battlefield, to prepare to die and when necessary, to die to accomplish the mission. That's the only reason democratic republics have armies. We don't need armies for other purposes, but we need professional armies who are prepared to kill and are prepared to die in defense of the society that without that expert work is absolutely defenseless. This is the other criteria of professions. Professions expert work are absolutely essential for the society to flourish. The sick have to be treated. Those going before trials want justice. Those who are fearful want security. That's expert work. And military expert work has to do with killing and, and dying. Now let's talk about the profession and the profession of arms. This is a campaign about the profession of arms in the United States Army. The Army's over 230 years old now, but it hadn't been a profession all that time. The Army started out as a series of colonial militias. The colonial militias were kept right under the thumb of the colonial legislatures. They even dictated how many barrels of hardtack, how many barrels of powder. Every slot in the regiment, every promotion in the regiment was approved by the colonial militias because they did not trust the military. We started this country with a deep distrust from our European roots of the sovereign who controlled the army. And we didn't want that to occur here. After the revolution, under the constitution, we still had militias and an army later that was very much controlled by the legislature and that's written into our constitution. It's one of the elements of tenets of our own profession, civilian control of the military, dual control, both the legislature and the executive. But notice that through all this period, work in the army was that of government occupation. It was just a job. There, the army was not professional. Military historians tell us that our army did not professionalize until the 1880s to the 1904. You can pick your historian and pick your date, but it's roughly that period of time. The establishment of the War College in 1904, Elihu Root's reforms was probably the culminating point, certainly the creation of Leavenworth earlier in the cavalry school, a professional form of education to take expert knowledge and develop expert professionals. So we professionalized shortly before the First World War, and generally we've been considered a professional army since then, with some ebbs and flows in the degree to which the army manifests the behavior of a profession.
And therein lies the central tension that we need to address in this campaign. The Army, in fact, has a dual structure. It is created by Congress in law as a hierarchical government occupation. By its own desire and by the necessity of defending the American people, it needs to be a vocational profession. That is a tension. Government occupations are jobs. People are motivated extrinsically by money, by position, by title in those kinds of occupations. In professions, the motivation is intrinsic. True professionals, they want to have a good income, but they're not overly concerned. If they'd wanted to make money, they'd have gone somewhere else. True professionals are servants, as General Kaslin pointed out. It's a life of servanthood. And the satisfaction of, to the servant is the job well done, the society well protected, the soldier well led. So there's an inherent tension in the Army at all times, in every unit in the Army, and we measure that by organizational climate, but there's a tension between an occupational mindset and culture and a professional mindset and culture. And what this campaign is about is trying to understand over the last nine years, how do we leverage the successes to keep moving army units and commands in the direction of profession and not allowing them to move to what would be the default position of just government occupation in a big hierarchical bureaucracy. There's immense wisdom behind this campaign. We need to do this. General Dempsey's absolutely right. We need to do it now. Why? Because you can see what's coming. Budget cuts are coming. And what happens to armies historically when budget cuts come? Salami slice and bureaucratization. We gotta get ahead of the power curve, and you get ahead of the power curve first intellectually and then programmatically. Now, let me summarize the rest of my comment with four, what I would consider that you should keep in your mind and in your dialogue. What are the four pillars of the Army as profession? If you looked at the Army or you looked at a unit or you looked at a command and you wanted to say to yourself, is this unit behaving as a profession? Do I really see profession in this unit? Notice, folks, I don't use the word professionalism ever because it's a word that has such broad meanings to everybody in this audience that you'll talk right by each other and not communicate well. So my suggestion is that the dialogue center on the word profession for the institution and the professional for the individual and leave out the isms because the isms simply do not communicate well, particularly to someone who's a researcher. So what are the four pillars if the Army is to be a profession of arms? The first, expert knowledge. That's the core, that's the only reason there is a profession. 